Um, and just before we go on with the introduction, could everyone here just, you can private chat it to any of the instructors. So um, all the instructors are co-hosts. We have, right, Tanvi, Keshav, Mark, Shrinjoy, um, and me and Sophie are actually um, just executive members of STEMI. So we're just here to, um, you know, moral support. So yeah, um, you can private chat or you can just publicly chat, um, just like a short introduction of yourself so we know who's with us today. It can be just your name uh, and your experience in physics. You don't have to have experience in physics for the class, but we just wanna see if you do have experience, you know, what classes have you taken? Maybe you've just self-studied. So yeah, just put that um, in the chat or you can unmute if you want. And we'll just take like a few moments for that. Well, if anyone private chats, um, it's cool. Oh, a few more. Awesome. Okay. Physics all in seven. Cool. I'm not sure if that's everybody. Um, but that's great to hear. We have some people with no experience. Uh, some of you guys are taking a physics course. So the last thing I want to say um, before I hand it over. Um, also, sorry, I didn't introduce myself, um, but I'm Diana and I'm the CEO for STEMI. Um, so I know some of you guys probably already know um, a bit about what STEMI does, but we do have classes uh, like this one for anatomy, molecular biology, physics, uh, set theory, geometry, and algebra. Um, we also have computer science classes for underprivileged students, um, specifically middle schoolers and um, special needs classes. So, and then in addition to that, we just started tutoring programs, um, still waiting for a few more responses before we launched that. And we also host conventions and speaker events. So just a little overview of what STEMI is. Um, so this class is taught by high schoolers who have already taken um, a physics course. And so uh, as you've already heard, most of the instructors, you know, they've taken either AP or a regular physics one, um, and many have taken two. So yeah, before I end my little spiel, uh, I just wanted to say this class is really great if you need homework help for physics, or if you want to like see how much you enjoy physics. So it's going to be uh, as Tanvi can say with the, the curriculum document structured after AP Physics 1. Um, but, you know, we can use the class sessions. Um, we can personalize the class sessions to what you guys really need. So if that's more homework help, you know, with your physics courses currently, um, or if that's just you want to actually come to have, you know, interactive lectures um, and peer to peer support as you learn physics. So very uh, customizable, you know, that's the benefit of like taking this class over Coursera. You can't easily um, ask your Coursera instructors for homework help and whatnot. Anyways, that's my spiel. So um, I hope you guys have a great, a great class and it is recorded for anybody who registered but could not come or can't see the whole thing. All right, I'm done, I'm done. Um, so Tanvi, you can take it away with the curriculum and then get started. Uh, on the actual presentation for today. Awesome. So as Diana said, I'm just going to go over a quick run through what we're going to cover. So as you can tell from this unit overview here, it's pretty similar to, oh yeah, sure, I'll zoom in. Does that help? Okay. Um, so this is the overview. It's pretty similar to what AP Physics 1 is. It's Um, so we start off with the introduction today, which is going to be basically the skills that we're going to require in AP Physics 1, not really material based. 
And then after that, we'll get more into the actual AP Physics 1 stuff. And we'll start with kinematics and go all the way through to DC circuits. Most of the initial courses have two classes, but then as we go on, they're going to probably be one week, one lecture-ish. So yeah, that's the overview. I'll stop my share so then Sir Joy can start presenting his, the initial part of the presentation. Cool. I hope you guys can see this. Uh, one sec. Um, in the chat, will the course materials be posted? Um, yeah, we'll be sending out like you know these presentations, um, coursework, homework. So, yes. Uh, let me just keep this open. Okay, so for this class, basically we're going to be trying to teach you the definition of physics and why we actually study it, why it's a subject, um, the definition of motion and how it's actually measured, and then how to manipulate mathematics to analyze this motion. So first we'll start out with the definition of, you know, why, I'm um, not, why is, what is physics? So um, according to Britannica, physics is the science science that deals with the structure of matter and the interactions between fundamental constituents of the observable universe. What this basically boils down to is that we're trying to explain the phenomena that um, in our universe through words, mathematics, and models. So here we'll just play a brief Khan Academy video um, just so that you guys can get an introduction to what physics actually is. I could imagine that even the earliest human beings, or possibly pre-human beings, had asked themselves the questions, why am I here? What is the nature of reality? Why is the universe organized the way that it is? And these questions are what we attempt to answer in the field of physics. In the field of physics, which you could view maybe right after mathematics as the purest of, of the sciences. So you have math, which is very pure. And then on that foundation of math, you have physics. And physics really does try to use that mathematics, along with some core ideas, to explain the phenomena, all the phenomena of the universe. And physicists will be the first to admit that they are just beginning to understand the nature of reality, the nature of everything around us. Now, a lot of times, we think physics is only limited to things like cosmological uh, phenomena, or getting rockets into space, or how waves move, or building structures. But physics is the foundation for all of the other sciences. When we think about chemistry, when we think about chemistry, which is at the end of the day interactions between atoms, those interactions are really physics-based interactions. So chemistry, chemistry is actually laid down on a foundation of physics. And then even when we think about ourselves, our bodies, even our consciousness, our brains, it really all boils down to chemistry and physics. It boils down to interactions between atoms and even mechanical properties of our bodies. And so even, even biology, even what we are, is built, on, is built on a foundation of chemistry. So this is biology right over here which is built on a foundation of physics, which is highly dependent on some of the math that you've been learning your whole life and that you will continue to learn. And that fundamental question that you might have said, well, you know, hey, why am I learning this math? Well, one, because the math is beautiful. But also, you will see that it starts to, in almost the most pure way, describe the structure of the universe. And we're going to see that more and more and more as we go into physics. All of this complex phenomena that you see around us, whether we're looking at a galaxy or we're looking at ocean waves, or we're looking at even biological systems, we'll see that a shocking amount of them can start to be described using some fairly elegant mathematics that we can build on and continue to build on. Simple or elegant mathematics like force is equal to mass times acceleration. And we're going to talk about force and acceleration as vector quantities. We're going to think about things like 
displacement. And I'll put it as a vector quantity. And, and we'll soon learn more about what vector and scalar quantities are. Displacement is equal to velocity times time. We'll learn things like acceleration is equal to change in velocity over change in time. And what we'll see with even a handful of very simple ideas like this, and we'll go into much more depth in future videos, you can explain all sorts of complex phenomena. And the one thing that I always loved about physics, and I don't think it's always fully appreciated, sometimes as you start to learn physics, you'll see all of these complicated formula, all of, the, all of these kind of complicated problems. But it's, it's super valuable to realize it's all coming from some of these basic ideas, some of the things that I just mentioned, these ideas we're going to explore ideas of energy. We're going to explore Newton's laws. We're going to explain, we're going to think about what, well, what are all the different types of forces out there and why they might, why they might actually exist. And it, it, at its essence, it's all about trying to explain the complexity of the universe, predict what is going to happen based on simple ideas. And that's what physics is all about. Now, when we think of physics, it's been studied by humanity for a very, very long time. In fact, I'm sure we don't know who the first physicist, the first, who the first physicists were. But some of the, the, I guess you could say, foundational thinkers in physics are these gentlemen that I have here. And this is just a, uh, maybe you could kind of say this is some of the most prominent thinkers in physics. But I, this is by no means a complete list. First and foremost, we'd want to include Isaac Newton, especially when you start to, to study physics. You're starting to understand the world as Newton understood it. He understood, hey, you know, things don't. I could imagine that even the. Uh, explain the complexity of the universe, predict what is going to happen, even what we are, is built on around the Earth. He developed. Sorry, guys, my share is being really weird. I could imagine that even the earliest human beings are probably. Hey, you know, things don't fall to the ground just because they always fall to, just because that's the way the universe is. That, that's, that's a force that's acting on it. And maybe that same force that's causing me to be stuck to my chair right now is what keeps Earth orbiting around the sun or the moon orbiting around, or, or the moon orbiting around the Earth. He developed law of gravitation, Newton's laws. And we're going to study that as we delve into our basic physics. And what we'll see, even classical mechanics, the, the, the physics that Newton established, can explain a large range of phenomena with amazing precision. But as we get into the, into the early 20th century, physics starts to get even more wild as we start to look at the scales of the super small. And we have Max Planck giving us quantum mechanics. And then we have Albert Einstein as we start thinking about uh, super fast speeds, the speed of light. And we realize it's an absolute that nothing can fa travel faster than the speed of light, which is, which is this mind-boggling thing that, that we have this notions of, of general and special relativity. And we start realizing that the universe universe is, is in some ways more bizarre and more mysterious and more fascinating than we ever could have imagined. But all of the work, even to understand the modern physics of Max, of Max Planck and Albert Einstein, it's based on a lot of the core ideas that were given to us by Isaac Newton and even people before Isaac Newton. So as you go into your study of physics, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a physicist wannabe. I, I wanted to be a physicist. I imagined kind of, because it's all about, we all wonder, why are we here? What is the nature of reality? Uh, what, what, why do things happen the way they are? And these are the questions that physics is attempting to answer. And so as you go into your study of physics, I want to leave you with some quotes from these three gentlemen. So the first two are from Isaac Newton. Truth is ever to be found in simplicity and not in the multiplicity and the confusion of things. And I really wanted to stress this because a lot of times in your studies you might be finding yourself memorizing formulas and, 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 and vocabulary. But that's, if you're doing that, you're just at the very surface. But if you really start to think about it and really start to think about where these things come from, it'll come to simpler and simpler and more intuitive ideas. And then you are getting closer to the truth. Now I love the second quote from Isaac Newton. I do not know what I may appear to I do not know what I may appear to the world, 
But to myself, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. I, I like to imagine, you know, there's so much. We, even though we think we know so much, that we haven't even learned a small fraction of how the universe really is. And even a, a great thinker like Isaac Newton, he recognized this. He's like, hey, I'm just kind of dabbling into the, into the seashore and picking up a pebble here, but there's this vast ocean that I can't even begin to understand. You can even imagine alien civilizations that are, that are thousands of years ahead of us technologically or scientifically or even millions of years, how they might perceive the reality and they might see us as ants and we are just beginning to, to scrape the surface of, of how the world works. This is from Max Planck. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And I find this to be pretty profound because it is true. As you study physics, you will start to see, well, most of what we consider to be reality, our current understanding is based on these forces. But what are these forces? And even these things that we think are solid, when we go down to the atomic level, we see it's mostly empty space. And it's really just the interaction of forces that make us think that something is solid or there or, or tangible in some way. And you realize these very tangible things aren't so, aren't so tangible after all. And at the end of the day, the whole world is just a, a, a mental model that we have. It's, in some ways, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's an illusion that our mind creates so that we can operate inside of it but we're just beginning to to understand it and last but not least and there's actually a ton of great quotes from these folks and others uh, but especially albert einstein the most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious it is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of true art and true science and i really want you to take this to heart as you study your physics there will be times where we're going to be building our toolkits. What's a vector? What's a scalar? Going into some mathematics, proving some formulas. Those are the toolkits, but then we're going to try to understand fundamental phenomena. How does the universe actually work? And if when we start to think about these, you don't get a few chills on, on your skin, a few goose, goose bumps, and feel that the universe is more mysterious than, than you thought, then, then we're not studying physics the way that we should be studying physics. All right, so that was just like an introduction into, you know, what physics is, what it's based in, things like that. Okay, so now one of the most common ways to describe physics is using words, right? Like if you have no background in physics, you can still say um, this car is moving at a constant velocity or a constant speed or, you know, I, I traveled this distance. But um, the terms that we use to describe physics, they also have these really strict definitions, especially once they're associated with mathematical quantities, right, these equations. Okay, so first, um, we need to talk about how to describe motion with words, right? So in order to do so, you need to first define a reference frame. So, um, so uh, you want to... Um, find a reference frame, right? So what is zero, zero? In other words, what is your origin? Or um, with what point are you defining your motion with respect to? Um, what direction is positive? For example, is north positive? Is uh, going up positive? Is going down positive? Things like that. Uh, so in other words, what is positive? What is negative? Because you need to have that um, coordinate system in order to define your quantities, right? So, and that goes into our second point. We need to use quantitative data. So We'll talk about this more in the slides that follow, but you need to have numerical values, right? So things like 20 miles per hour or 16 meters um, in order to paint the entire picture of the event, right? If you say something like the car is going fast, sure, we, we think it's going fast, but it doesn't provide a complete picture, right? Fast to you and fast to someone else is relative, uh, whereas the 20 miles per hour, when uh, defined properly, is absolute. So with these steps, you can explain any motion so that others can understand what has occurred. Okay, um, so now we'll go, actually, should I share my screen? Okay. So now we'll go into physics as mathematics, and as, as, along with a narrative, mathematics is essential in describing how physics works, what are the terms, and just being able to paint that entire picture we were talking about. 
So first up, some definitions. So as we mentioned before, in physics, there are quite strict def definitions when we work with terms. So that includes position, distance, displacement, speed, velocity, and acceleration. Um, can you guys just, I just want to have a quick sense of where you guys are at. Could you just put a thumbs up, thumbs down if you've heard of these phrases? Wait, I don't think there's a thumbs down. Oh, a yes or a no, if that's, yeah? Okay, so Abigail, please. Yeah, you can react with like another emoji if, you, if it's a no. So, I mean like in participants, you know how you can put like a yes tick or a no tick? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, yeah. Okay, it seems like some people have seen it, so I'll still go through it. So position is, can be considered a, a position. Well, we know how position is in English, just where you're at relative to another point. And that other point is what we usually define as zero, zero. And distance can be considered the total area covered. So that is, if you step two feet forward and you step two feet back, the total area that you're covering is four feet, even if the displacement, which we'll go after later, is just zero. And that's the, dif the displacement is the distance or difference between the initial and the final position. So in that example before, a very common example they use when describing physics for the first time is taking a lap around a track, for example, if you're a runner. So even if you run the entire 100 or 500 meters, if you end up at the same place you were in the beginning, your displacement is still zero. Speed is the distance per unit time. So how much is your speed, how much is your distance changing per second or per minute? And velocity is the same thing as speed, but for displacement. So we usually talk, and this is a common misconception when we talk in daily terms, but we usually say the speed of the car is five miles per hour when in fact, we're usually talking about velocity. And acceleration is the velocity per unit time. So how fast is your velocity changing? If you're traveling at a constant velocity, your acceleration is zero. But if you have an accel a velocity that's going one meter per, se per second, two meters per second, then you're increasing with an acceleration of one. So the term before, it's very important to recognize the difference between a scalar and a vector. And you guys probably heard this in the Khan Academy section where he was talking about how we'll be using these terms to define the words that we'll be using. So scalars are quantities without a magnitude. For example, just two um, miles per hour. That we don't know the direction of that. We don't know anything else, just that it's two meters per hour. And scalars can be added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided by each other. And a vector is very similar to a scalar, but you add a direction. And most of the times we'll be dealing with velocity rather than speed in physics one, just because it has that direction. So that can be in terms of words. So you can say north, south, east, west. You could also be using things like a positive sign, a negative sign, which you often see when we work with a coordinate grid. And similar to scalars, these can be added and subtracted, and they can also be multiplied by a scalar, which in a sense is just multiplying by a constant. Oh, also before I move on, there are videos throughout the slideshow that we're gonna share with you, and if you need any more assistance, if you're confused with something, obviously you can reach out to us, but you can also check out these videos. And now adding on to the words that we discussed before, we have certain variables, um, and then obviously which quantity they are, calculations, and the common units that we use. So position, displacement, velocity, and acceleration, they're all vectors. And if you think about that for a second, I'm sure you guys can understand when we're working with a coordinate system, you have a negative position, right? If you're behind something, usually, you can have a negative displacement, if you go forwards two, but then you move back four, you have a negative displacement. Velocity, you can, that's of course, it has a direction if you're going north versus if you're going south, and same thing with acceleration. 
And these are the variables that we commonly use. Of course, the variables can change because they're just a letter associated with a term, but this is what most common physicists use. And the arrows on top of the letters is what we use to define a vector. And the triangle is a delta to show change. And these are the calculations, which is very close to the definitions we explained earlier, right? The um, distance per time, the displacement per time, and the velocity per time. And these are the most common units we have, although you can obviously see feet or centimeters or something else. And these are the vector operations that we were discussing earlier. So vectors are considered to be equal if they have not only the same magnitude, but also the same direction. So in that sense, you can't say something that's two meters per hour north is the same as two meters per hour south. They are different vectors. And when we draw them in terms of a diagram, we use arrows like this and label them with the magnitude. And of course, it has to be in line with the direction. So if you can see here, this negative sign means that it's going in a negative direction. But these three are all positive, so they're in the opposite direction. And the vectors can be added, subtracted, and scaled. So added, we just add up the tails together. If you can see this, if this is the A, then you add up this tail to this head, and you draw the line. And the vector that goes from the initial position of A to the final position of B is what, we can, is what can be considered the sum of the vectors. And most people get confused because it seems like there can be multiple ways to add these vectors, when in fact, they're just two. One is this, and one is this. And they both, at the end of the day, result in the exact same vector. And it's important to recognize, again, the importance of direction in this. If you were to flip the direction, then you get a completely different vector sum. And subtraction is basically just um, flipping the direction. If you just take this vector, or here's a better example. This is V. If you just flip it in the opposite direction, you get negative V. And that you can think about adding a negative number, right? It's the same value, but just a negative sign. So at the end of the day, you're just subtracting. And with scaling, that is multiplying by a constant or a scalar, which is sort of where you can see the term comes from. And that's literally just multiplying. So if a negative two is the vector, you can multiply by two, you get negative four. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. And now I think, who's K-Shove's doing models? Yeah. And so one of the last things we're gonna talk about today is physics as a model. And um, as we mentioned in the Khan Academy video, um, one of the ways that we treat um, physics is using math to understand the world and nature around us. And so the way we're gonna do this kind of an AP Physics one is often using graphs, as you mentioned, the coordinate system, but there's also something else we're gonna to get to, and those are types of systems. So before I get into them, I just want to see if anyone, does anyone have an idea of what the types of systems are that, you know, we can't uh, commonly treat in the real world? You can just put them in the chat. You can raise your hand. Um, if you're totally new to physics, it's fine. But if you've ever seen it before, go ahead and give it a shot. Hmm. Actually, I can't see the chat right now. So if anyone, if any other co-hosts could just let me know if anyone's raising their hand. No raise hands yet. Well, I'll let you know if something comes up. So I'll give like 10 more seconds if anyone wants to take a guess in the chat. What do you think the different types of systems are if you've heard in the world? And um, after that, I'll just go ahead and field them. All right, so um, the three types of systems that you know we commonly deal with in AP Physics 1 are isolated systems, um, which are 
here, um, closed systems and open systems. And so there's a few key differences between them. Open systems basically exchange matter and energy with their surroundings. And matter is anything that you know has mass, has like a kind of substance. Um, energy is, um, we'll, we'll get to a more formal definition of matter and energy in you know, future classes. Energy is kind of like um, the ability for something, ability of an object to kind of you know, do something useful in its surroundings. So in open systems, you're just transferring matter and energy around. So if you give an example here, let's say you have boiling water on the stove, and um, you'll see that it loses water vapor, it loses water as water vapor into the air, which is its surroundings, and it also loses heat, which is uh, also gains heat, um, which is energy. So, um, so you can see that's how it's transferring matter and energy. A closed system just cannot transfer ma um, matter. So basically, if we have a, if we just put a lid on that, and you can see the water can't leave the pot. And so that means we're keeping all the matter in there, but we can still exchange heat, right? We can still keep um, energy and everything um, from the surroundings and the pot. And the last type of system is isolated systems. And these are systems uh, where nothing is exchanged with the surroundings. And we, you can see that thermal flasks, I don't know if anyone has them right now, but they're the closest thing we can kind of think about in this analogy. In the real world, there are no perfectly isolated systems, but it simplifies calculations and a lot um, when we think about you know, isolated systems as opposed to closed systems this way. And so there's a famous statistician, I don't actually remember his name, but he talked about how all, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this is kind of why we're turning to isolated systems right now, because um, they're wrong in the sense that they're not truly there in the world, but they're useful and that they can almost, you know, accurately to a degree, um, tell us what's going on around in the world. And so this is why we, the reason why we need to know these systems is because when we draw diagrams to illustrate motion or illustrate um, energy flow or something like that, it's important to know what type of system we're analyzing. And so when we're going to turn to forces in, I think, in two weeks, we're going to start looking at free body diagrams, and we're going to have to you know, pay attention to um, can energy be lost in the form of friction and things like that. And so on this note of graphs, um, we're going to get started with motion a little bit today and kind of finish it up in our next class. So the first, there's um, three types of graphs that you commonly deal with in AP Physics 1, and these are position versus time, velocity versus time, and acceleration versus time. And again, going back to what Tanvi talked about when she mentioned position, velocity, and acceleration, position is the location of an object, and we usually have it in some reference frame. So for example, um, I'm standing and um, I'm standing at four zero in reference to the origin of Earth. Um, velocity versus time is kind of how quickly um, your displacement, which is a measure of position almost, is changing. And acceleration versus time is a measure of how velocity is changing. So in this example, we have a car traveling with a constant acceleration. And of course, if it has a constant acceleration, you'll see that the acceleration does not change. Um, time will almost always be graphed on the x-axis, and uh, position, velocity, and acceleration will be graphed on the y-axis. So if there's a constant acceleration, then you can see that it'll just be a flat line at that acceleration. And remember, since acceleration is a change in velocity, we know that velocity will be changing at the same rate, has the same slope throughout. So slope is actually acceleration in a velocity versus time graph. And since velocity is a measure of how quickly position is changing, uh, if velocity is changing at a constant rate, that means that position is also changing um, at more than a constant rate, kind of. And you can see it forms a parabola, a concave of parabola. And so we'll get more to kind of these graphs in the future uh, classes, so don't worry too much if it was a little hard. This time we'll get a lot more into kinematics and the study of motion in the future. If you need any um, additional help, if you want to take a look before we get to that, you can watch a couple of links. We'll send out with the slide and you can read these readings. Um, graphs are very important in AP Physics 1. They show up in almost every AP test, especially position, velocity, and acceleration. So we'll be spending a lot more time on that in the future. And so here we've given a kind of strength building exercise. 
to practice um, physics as a narrative, physics as math, and physics as graphs. And so we'll send it out. You guys can take a look and get some practice. And then hopefully by next time, um, you know, we can, um, we all have a bit of a more solid foundation on how we're using math in physics before we get into the actual um, content that's covered in the AP. And so that's all we have for this week. Um, feel free to ask any questions. I know we went by a little bit fast, especially um, for the types of models, the vector addition and that stuff. So if you're still unsure about position, velocity, acceleration, or anything like that, you can feel free to leave it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, so someone asked if you signed up for trial classes, how do you sign up for the other classes? I think Diana would be able to give the best answer for that one. Yeah, so I just made a form. Uh, we'll send out the form right now. Uh, Tommy, could you actually post the link in the chat? Yeah, sure. Is it the same one you sent to us? Yes, it's the one. Yes. And there's um, Another question, will there be a Google cl Classroom where all the resources are posted? Yeah, so for um, for summer, we use Google Classroom, uh, depending on like physics instructors. Um, if you guys want to use Canvas, I know it's been very popular with some schools. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely have a repository for where the resources are posted. We may end up using like the actual STEM Enrichment Youth website for that but that's a bigger project so we're not sure if that will happen fast enough um you, but there'll definitely be a platform for for resources right you could always just use the disc the physics class discord yeah and the and the discord um the thing about the so about the signing up for trial classes i made a form where basically it's for feedback and also for your availabilities to see uh, what format you guys prefer for the classes as well as what times work for you on the weekends. Um, I only put weekends for now, but if weekends don't work for everyone, we can consider other dates depending um, on the physics instructor's availabilities. These classes are completely free. Everything regarding STEMI is free. Yeah, we will never ask for uh, any charge. So yeah, just fill out that form that uh, Tanvi sent out. And if everyone could do that, even if you're not planning to attend future classes, um, please, please fill out that form. That in the Discord for the people that aren't here. So if you can't fill it out right this second, make sure you fill it out on the Discord. So is that it? Yeah, you can stop recording, Tommy. Sorry, I was...